Good evening and welcome. Good evening and welcome to uh, Facebook Live. Facebook Live last night we spoke about the shadows and looked at step one and step two in the recovery process and so that was a friend of mine just uh, messaging me to say that he's He's coming in, so welcome. And last night we looked at step one and step two. Step one, acceptance. And tonight we're going to look at step three and step four. Hi, Annette. Hope America is good at the moment. I think you're about a week ahead of us in lockdown right now, so we're not far behind you. And... Okay, so I'm going to start by saying I think it's important for us to swipe that away. I think it's important for us to redefine addiction and change some of the ingrained belief systems that we have around it. Addiction is not merely a compulsive behaviour and... <coughs> is a behaviour performed explicitly for the purpose of providing instant relief. Uh, that relief we seek could be from a conscious or an unconscious pain. And this is the way I see it, but if I, <clears throat> if I, hurt my fa if I hurt myself, if I, uh, if I was, the way I look at it is if I was, if I was hammering a nail, into a fence and I missed the nail and I hit my thumb with the hammer, I would be in pain. I would, that, would, that would hurt. And the first thing I would do is I would, the very first thing I would do is I would, I would grab it to put some pressure on it. And then I may, if the pain continued, I would then look at taking a painkiller. Okay. So by the mere merit of us being human, and from, you know, probably conception through to birth, um, we've been traumatised in some way, and we have, hi Leslie, we have pain. So that pain could have came from primary school or even a judgement that we had um, about our own family or something like that. So we've what we've done is we've got these pains that are inside us that are, equally if not as erroneous as a pain if you hit your thumb with a hammer but we can't see that and we don't recognize that and we go through our life and then we start to um go to harris that would be great that would that would certainly help somebody's just typed in there let's go to harris and um, now, I'm, now i've lost my train of thought but um right so get back up get back in the flow here a bit so through pains and we grow up and we experience trauma and we experience pain in our life as children and we internalise that pain and then we become adolescents and older and, you know, somebody gives us a, a drink or a cigarette or whatever and, you know, cocaine or heroin, they are effectively painkillers, you know, they're an anaesthetic and um, we like them. So that's a way that we start to mask the conscious or unconscious pain that we have experienced. Now, we know that drugs and alcohol cause great harm when used in, the, in this pursuit. And the individual, whether they do something about it or not, most of the time, can get a handle on their behaviours, their addictive drives. But then there's those who find themselves in destructive cycles with relationships with food, with work, um, 
they work for abusive bosses, or we find ourselves in conflict a lot of the time. Then there is consumerism and habits found online way too easy, such as gambling and pornography, and these kind of addictions are much harder to recognise these patterns as easily as external substances. Um, I see no value in becoming an extremist to seek a better way of living and certainly do not feel um, it is important to dig up the intergenerational graveyards of our past and disappear down a rabbit hole. At this stage, it's more beneficial to keep it simple. Hi, Sandy. Um, it's more beneficial to keep it simple. And you need only the ability to feel in your life that something's missing and that there must be a better way of finding it than the method that we're currently using. Um, human beings, like personalities, are multifaceted and are deeply complex creatures. And um, we are, we're, we're also very tied into the human condition. That human condition, which for me, I feel is the underlying core and one of the biggest challenges that we have of being, being human and thinking about the issues of the human condition can be really depressing. I mean, I avoid it as much as I can. Um, in short, the human condition uh, arises from the existence of so-called good and evil in our makeup. Uh, we as human beings are capable of shocking acts of humanity like rape, murder and torture and our agonising predicament or, or conditioned predicament or condition that has been, uh, that we have never been able to explain or understand why this level of duality exists within us. In our everyday behaviour we are competitive aggressive and selfish when clearly the ideals of life are to be the complete opposite, like being co cooperative, loving and indeed selfless. This uh, predicament of not being able to understand ourselves meant that the more we tried to understand ourselves, the more we tried to think about this important question about human behaviour um, or why it is so imperfect, the more depressed our thoughts became. So clearly to avoid becoming suicidally depressed, we learned very early on in our lives as children um, when the direction from our parents was so contradictory to our internal drives, we couldn't allow our minds to go on that thought journey. And we learned to totally avoid the whole depressing subject of the human condition and in many ways had to dissociate from such primitive drivers and we learned very early on to wear a mask of conformity in order to be um, loved and accepted by our parents and society. Certainly and quite understandably given how guilty that um, we have felt about our seemingly imperfect behaviour, we invented excuses for being competitive, aggressive and selfish. As I mentioned, the main excuse we have used, to, we've used the main excuse that we've had for being aggressive and selfish is we have a savage animal instinct that makes us fight and compete for food, shelter, territory and a mate, that biochemical, that biochemical understanding of that. The brain, those primitive drivers that that that, that cause us to um, act in such a way, but in our hearts of hearts, we we knew that this was only the excuse that we had to use until we found the real reason for our uh, device device division. We split or split or split type of behaviour. As I said, it conventionally overlooks the fact that our human behaviour involves our unique, fully conscious thinking mind. And descriptions of our behaviour, like egocentric, 
or arrogant or deluded, artificial, hateful, mean, immoral, alienated, etc. all imply a psychological dimension to our behaviour. The psychological problem in our species is the thinking mind that we have suffered from in this dilemma of our human condition. The issue of our species of good and indeed evil, afflicted, less than ideal, seemingly imperfect, even fallen or, and I mentioned that last night, or fallen state um, or corrupted state, we humans suffer from a conscious derived psychologically human condition, not an instinct controlled animal condition. It is unique to us, the savage animal instincts in us, that excuse also overlooks the fact that we human beings can be extremely altruistic, cooperative, lovel, loving, kind, compassionate, and we have moral instincts. Uh, what we recognise is our conscious and these moral instincts in us are not derived from being reciprocal, from situations where you only do something for others in return for a benefit from them, as some biologists would have us believe we have unconditionally selfless, fully altruistic, fully loving, genuinely moral conscience. When when we're in the clutches of addiction, that uh, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back kind of mentality of codependency is rife. It's um, when we're in the clutches of, of addiction, the, the rage that comes out when somebody that we have done something for earlier on and they don't reciprocate that. It's like a child having a tantrum. So we are fully altruistic, truly loving and genuinely moral and conscious as well. Our original instinctive state is the opposite of being competitive and selfish. But um, we, are, we, we, we as human beings are, and in times like this, uh, we're day eight um, in lockdown, and we are very cooperative. And there is also a selfless and loving aspect of us. Uh, which is the polar opposite to when really there was a couple of old women. They were old. old I'm not, that's not. They were old. <laughs> you know, they were pensioners and they were fighting over a loaf of bread and and Morrison's uh, last week. It's just bizarre to watch what this is bringing out in people. But um, nonetheless, we're in it, so we've just got to crack on, regardless. Stiff upper lip, old boy, and got on with it. Anyway, when we've understandably uh, grimly held to. Uh, such excuses as blaming our dark side on our supposed savage animal instincts. Um, our moral conscience knows full well that humans have loving and kind, certainly not aggressive and mean instincts. Um, when we are young, when we are children, and we haven't yet embraced such dishonest excuses. Excuse me, people are just messaging me. It's nice to read them as they're coming through. Um, what was I talking about? Uh, when we were children, when we're children, we have um, we've not as children we've not made up any dishonest excuses. Um, you know we're a lot more authentic, and it's obvious to us then that there is something extremely lo extremely wrong with the way that humans are behaving. Um, I genuinely think that uh, six year olds, five year olds, three year olds, nine year olds have much more of an intellectual capacity to be able to understand that something's uh, very, very wrong with uh, with, <laughs> with the human race, really. I think it's the opposite way around it. I think we should put children in charge of the world because um, they're a lot uh, cleaner than the adult children that we have running the world at the moment, but we're getting off, um, we're getting off track a bit there. So, um, for me, I remember it was around about the Live Aid concert, which was goodness, when was that? Live Aid concert was nineteen nineteen. Wish I had a little bit. I could Google it. When was the Live Aid concert? Uh, nineteen eighty five. 
1985. So I'd have been about 12. And then I remember the question I asked my mum was, why is this concert? What's going on with this concert? So back when I was 12, I guess I was probably exploring the human condition, not really knowing. And I asked my mother why Live Aid was going on, this huge concert that Bob Geldof had uh, rustled up in a matter of months um, to get everybody on stage. And my mother's answer was uh, they're raising money for the Edo, uh, uh, for the, what was it? My, my mother's answer was they're raising money for the incredible imperfection of human life. And I thought, well, what does that mean? And it was then that the harsh reality of human beings, the same as me, were living in Africa in starvation. And that really got me to think about how imperfect this was. And I then started to think about the tremendous suffering in the world. And I remember clearly, I remember really clearly after that concert, going through my bedroom and um, saying that if there was a God, they wouldn't let that happen. And I guess it was then that I turned my back on my higher power. I turned my back on God. And I guess I got into a fight with him. I really thought about that much. And... Um, Yeah, I don't know many 12-year-olds in my life right now, but um, I'm sure the next time I speak to a 12-year-old, I'll certainly ask them what their thinking is of the human condition and what they think of the suffering that's currently going on in the world. But they've probably developed somewhat since I was 12, and they're probably more having those kind of thoughts at 8 or 9 now rather than 12. But So, as you know, as you transition through your life, and I remember about, kind of being about 14 Nin yeah, 1986, I was about 14, uh, 86, or something like that. Terrible with dates sometimes. Um, but I started to think more deeply about life and I deepened to the point where I realised those imperfections in my parents and they were separated, and or they were separating or going through a separation, which a wound which magnified my teenage indifferences towards others and indeed magnified my anger and even hatred and self-hatred and magnified my selfishness and greed. And looking back, it was at that point I somehow discovered that man's inhumanity to man wasn't only towards the external world, but that man's inhumanity to man had actually took a stranglehold. Um, sorry, Stevens just wrote, I once heard a man say addiction tells me my pain is pleasure. I'm sorry, Stephen, it's went up and I missed that. I'm really sorry. Um, what was I talking about there? Man's inhumanity to man. I realised when I was 14 that that statement, man's inhumanity to man, was not just directed at the external world and to the outer world, but also it took a stranglehold on my internal world as well. And when you entwine that with marijuana at 14, it was at that point I stepped into bed with a substance which allowed me to disappear from the subject of the human condition. And it was then that the self-seeking, <clears throat> self-regulating compulsive behaviours was born, was born in me. Again, as I look back now from the perspective I've gained through working the steps and focusing on my recovery, I can recognise that throughout this process there were no adults in my world that could help this 14-year-old self. Because, of course, they had completely dissociated and had already resigned to living in denial of the issue that faced them of the human condition. So, nobody's really taught us, not in my experience very well, how to harness the power of the shadow. Everyone wants us to look at the light which creates such a dis disconnection or a disparity, I think was the word I was going to say there. And it's... Um, these are the kind of areas that through recovery work that we get to explore and we get to look at and um, 
my ADHD. I get so distracted by people sending me little messages, which is which is really nice. It's nice to see them in the screen. And in the recovery world, we talk about in the recovery world we talk about Jekyll and Hyde complex, which is understood by most addicts and alcoholics that I know. And we know only too well the personality that goes out on a Thursday for a paper and a pint of milk and uh, comes home on a Sunday when they've run out of money, lost their bank cards, phone and any sense of dig dignity that we ever had. And we can blame that. We can blame that. Oh, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, we went, we went, we went wild. We, we got the taste for it and that was it. And there is, though, rather than just talking about the Jekyll and Hyde, there is an existence, I believe, an existence of another, uh, a better, higher self that we have yet to realise. And that's where step three is coming in, which I'll talk about later on. And um, there's a much better, um, higher aspect of ourselves that we've yet to realise before we can realise uh, this part of us fully, we must often get in touch with the dark side. Uh, furthermore, upon seeing the light in ourselves, we've also got to learn to nurture that. Because while we may keep the darkness at bay to the point of never hearing from it again, our base nature never truly disappears. It's like a small... It's like a it's like a cat sleeping in the corner. It's never really a, never really asleep, is it? You get into the room and its eyes are open instantly. And um, the way I like to think about it is, it's like a it's like a naked flame, and it's just waiting for somebody to walk along and put a gallon of petrol over the top of it, and it'll just um, it's just ready to explode. It's ready to engulf us and take us hostage once more. Um, we cannot come. We can't come by this new self through an old way of thinking, we have to completely and utterly radically change how we think about our world and indeed ourself. But when we've been so conceptualised into the way that we're thinking that's drove us into addiction, that's a huge pattern to change, which we spoke about last night. We crave to be free, but when we have freedom, we don't know what to do with it. And the majority of people that have been incarcerated in prison for many years come out and just do an act of criminality in order to go back into the institution because... Our society's completely institutionalised them. And um, anyway. And we can't come by any new way of being by our old way of thinking in the same way that Jekyll created Hyde, uh, didn't he, through a misguided ambition and bad science. <laughs> our pre-addict selves were, in fact, the same people who sought to escape. Uh, we may harbour dreams of becoming our old selves, but we can't. Yeah, we really want to be our old self. And that never really goes away. But we can't. We don't have the capacity. We don't have the capacity for stress. We don't have the capacity for... hiding in the shadows anymore. Because once we've come out of the darkness and we've come into the light... It's so difficult to start to navigate that world again. And um, whoever we were before we started using, we can never be that person again. I'm just taking some time to think about that myself. Um, our, sobri our sobriety totally depends on an acceptance of this truth. And it's at this point that we come to step three. Step three... <coughs> is where we've made a conscious decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. Or her. <laughs> made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand her. In my time, I've seen too many people getting carried away trying to, trying to figure this step out, really. Um, don't try and figure this step out. Uh, really don't try and figure it out and you're trying to find a higher power and people get so, they get caught up in knots um, if I've ever been doing any step work with people oh, another week goes by and another week goes by and I can't get this, I cannot get this step I can't get the higher power and um, that kind of makes me quite frustrated really because um, it's like just do it 
really just get it. And it's at this point getting a carried away is just a distraction, but it's it can also getting getting lost in trying to figure out what your higher power is can be a it can be a defence mechanism against um, going any further with our step work and many. What do you think of practicing spiritual pr principles? And do you think if you work on the spiritual malady of the rest fixes? I'll come back to that, Stephen. I'll open that up. Um, sorry. Um, it's a defence mechanism uh, against going any further with your step work. And many throw the towel in here. Many throw the towel in at step three. And um, because the unconscious mind does not want you to get three step three. The unconscious mind doesn't want you to get beyond it. The unconscious mind uh, doesn't want you to move forward because then, of course, it would lose power over you and then you would start getting into step three, step four, step five. And and there's a part of you that wants to stay in the old patterns of behaviour. And when you start to get into step three, which is giving your life over to a higher power, you know, it's starting to turn light onto all those gargoyles that are inside you, and you're all like, bright lights, bright lights, bright lights, I'm like, get the fuck out of here, and you know, it's, it's difficult, so, uh, I swear I'm quite firm with clients, and it's just find something that works for you, I don't care what it is, get a totem, get a spirit animal, you know, whatever, it could be your home group, is it God, great, is it science, great, it, it doesn't matter, it's cool. It could be somebody that you've met at your home group. It could have been an individual. It could be somebody that just smiled on you in a bus that day and made you feel good. And that's the point. If you've got a pet, use a pet. And if you've not got a pet, use your neighbour's pet. And just do your best to get something. And at this point in your step work, just push any conflicting feelings about religion out the door. If you don't believe in God, that doesn't matter. It really does not matter. It's just, and this step was never set up with the boys, um, it was never set up with the boys for you to be a, relig a, re a, re a religious obligation. It was never meant to be religious. It was just meant to be that you can relinquish control because you've not got any control. It's quite simple. Just, uh, you know, stop trying to make it, stop trying to make it difficult. And um, it's, it's, it's just a step that's meant to help you abstain from... Uh, the behaviour that you were doing and give up the illusion that you're in control, just hand it over to your higher power. And it, it really does, it works. And step four, so that's step three, just give your life over to your higher power. We're rushing through the steps here. <laughs> Thought, if anybody's actually doing these steps, we'll have finished them by Saturday. They'll be in, um, they'll be in hyperdrive. This should take a whole lot longer than six days to do your steps. I reckon a kind of nice time to do your steps is about 90 days. Um, I think if you can do, I think if you've got the time and you can do 90 meetings in 90 days and um, we can take, we can take a kind of at least a week, two weeks, 10 days on each step, um, that gives a good good amount of time for it to, to settle and for you to make the changes that you need to make on it. Because step four is really a foundation step. It's really a step that sets us up. It sets us up for step 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and would it set us up for 12? Aye, of course it would. It would set us up for 12. It sets us up for the rest of the steps. And that's the thing, you get some half-wits and some baked idiots that I've heard online turning around and saying, I'm your man to do a one-step process with. I'm like that. Aye, magic. Um, aye, that, that works. Have you ever been in a meeting room, mate? Just absolute clowns. Um, and that was a judgment, but really, there's 12 steps for a reason. And um, when you start to study them, they're fantastic how they work together, how they dance together, and how they're all interwound and interwoven. And um, they're great. But um, step four is a foundation step, which, which basically is set up to give us a clearer understanding of ourselves and to address our shortcomings and failings. And that nobody wants to admit that they're no very good or things are. You know, I find reading really difficult and um, I find asking for help really difficult and um, um, I've got loads of weaknesses which I'm not going to share online. That's for a meeting room, but um, it's about taking stock of these failings and shortcomings because by not 
taking an inventory of our weaknesses and bringing them up to the light, those weaknesses will always have power over us. So my suggestion is to get real on it and get really down and get really dirty and get into the depths of the nitty gritty of it and search to the depths of your soul and write a moral inventory of all your defects and which will show the chinks in your armour. And these moral defects will show where you've got weaknesses. And what we've been doing is we've been sticking plasters over them, with alcohol and drugs or Ralph Lauren badges and been wearing Ralph Lauren shirts for about fucking 30 odd year. And that's a badge. That's a badge of honour. I wear it on my chest, you know, and that's to make make me not feel weak in some kind of way. Um, I'm getting much better with that, but still nonetheless that's another label that um is a chink that, that, that that's part of my defects. So get real with your defects, get right in about them, just get right in, dive down, get a bit of pen and a bit of paper and start writing down the places where you're weak. Um because when we do that, which is step four, when we tie that back into step one, which is why I'm saying they're so clever, because the minute we have acceptance of something it takes the charge out of it. Anything which we deny, we give power to. So all the things that we're actually denying about ourselves and we're putting away, we're actually, paradoxically, we're giving those 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 anything power over us. We deny we're an alcoholic. We deny that we're drinking too much. We deny that our behaviour's out of control. What we're doing is we're suppressing that and we're actually fueling it and giving it power. So it's about it's about changing the dynamics. The minute you the minute that you turn round and accept it. You're changing the power dynamics and you're putting you back in the driver's seat because for so long you were in the passenger seat with a madman that was driving about like a lunatic. You're getting bounced about. You don't even know where you're going. You don't even know where you're going to wake up. And you, you then start to get into step one and acceptance and you're looking at the driver at that point. You're like, he's a bloody lunatic. I'm getting out of this motor, right? And then that gives you some power back. And then what you do is you get into one of those kind of... Um, you know, Hollywood movie type scenes and you open the driver's side door and you kick him right out of it and you get into the, you get into the driver's side again and you, you slow, slow back a wee bit. You start to drive at a much more regular speed and that starts to feel dead, dead good. That starts to feel really nice because you're not in, you're not in hypervigilance. You're not going so fast. But the only way that you've, ma that you've figured out thus far to manage your stress is by tanking a bottle of wine at night or battering into a few lines or going to see a hooker on the way up the road or whatever your vice might be. So, as I said, step one, how does that affect step four? Well, when you get into step four and you can you can accept that I'm not the greatest reader in the world and um, I also am the, I don't feel I could be the most articulate or rather I was told that I wasn't the most articulate. Um, I've been told that, and I've internalised that. So those 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 things that other people have told me, I've internalised, and um, I've I've owned them as my own. They've showed up as a weakness, and I've started to believe it. And in actual fact, it's not completely true. Um, I do manage to have conversations with people that are far more educated than I am, and they seem to understand what I'm saying. So that works. Um, so that's step four, and. Step three and step four. So if you're working the programme and you're looking at this kind of stuff, then I hope that that's helpful. We're looking at kind of... I love shadow work. Um, I love the unconscious. I love looking at it and exploring it. And um, I'm glad to hear that a lot of people are looking at doing that as well in these very difficult times. And... Um, I've actually, I was out very early this morning. I don't really know what's going out in the world today at all. So um, I don't know what people are feeling or sensing. I've got no idea about that. Um, <clears throat> I was out first thing. But what I did notice, which was um, through no conscious choice at all, was that I've not had any sweets today. I haven't ate badly in any way. The amazing power of sharing and, you know, sharing one of my defects last night. And then, lo and behold, today, miraculously, I have not felt any urge or any compulsion to go and have some biscuits or eat a packet of wine gums or basically anything that was left in the cupboards, kids' sweeties, anything at all. So that's a good thing. That's a positive. 
and I'm going to come back in tomorrow night at if there's any questions about this which I believe there is so I think we've still got some time I don't know I wasn't going to keep everybody too long tonight let me just what are we on that's 35 minutes I've been rabbling on for uh, let me just see Stephen Snedden my big pal had asked me a question so let me see what Stephen Snedden has asked me and um, see if I can answer that for you Mr Snedden Facebook um, sign into Facebook 10 things um, Stephen it'd be really good if you could just talk to me Send me a WhatsApp message or something. Um, wait a minute. I'll go down through this. We'll do it the old-fashioned way. Oh, my goodness. Kevin Zanny Fraser's watching. Oh, no. I feel as if... God. Now, that guy knows the steps. And um, if ever I've met anybody in 20-odd years of being run about these rooms, that guy knows his work without a shadow of a doubt. And, um, you know... Um, Credit where credit's due, Kevin, Zanny Fraser. You are absolutely miraculous at what you do. Stephen Snedden, what do you think of practising spiritual principles and do you think if you work on the spiritual malady, the rest all fixes itself out? Um, I don't know what the word malady really means. I guess what you're trying to ask, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering, Stephen, if you're asking me that to avoid doing step work. Because everybody's always looking for another way, aren't they? Another way to do it. And I think my direct answer to you, boy, would be, are you looking at uh, practising other spiritual principles? I'm guessing maybe like, or oh, meditating or a spiritual practice like swimming in the river or something like that that all fixes itself out. No, absolutely not. I think you can get through um, recovery through not practicing the steps. But I think a person that does that has to have been gifted with far more resilience than most of the people in recovery that I meet have. They're, 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 they're very few. And um, I think there's a lot of get out... Um, Let's just get out of doing it. Let's get out of doing the work because we don't want to do the work, basically. But we're going to talk anyway, so I'm sure that um, I'm sure that you and I will have some time to talk about what you really mean. Sorry, I never answered it quite as effectively as I could have. Um, what's Annette said to me? Turn, turn and become as little children, indeed. Stephen, right, here he's here. I once heard a man say, addiction tells me my pain is pleasure. A wee snort of lust or a wee hint of rage, disease of perception. Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. Um, the easy thing about, I'm probably going to lose a lot of people and I could rabbit on here for hours, um, but if I pulled out a gram of coke right now and started battering lines off the table, you'd be able to see them, that's pretty easy. But human beings are electrochemical organisms that inhabit a biochemical bodysuit that therefore inhabit an electromagnetic field. We are a biochemical. We are made up of trillions of synapses that have each got an electrical charge that then creates a chemical component. The biggest drug dealer that I've ever met in my life. And I've knew a few. A few are probably watching this right now, but the biggest drug dealer I've ever met lives right inside my head. The drug dealer that lives inside my head makes Pablo Escobar look like he was a $10 dealer. Because every time I have a thought, I have a chemical. And it's super, super quick. I can't remember the statistics, but if you mainline heroin and you stick it into your arm and you shoot the needle, it hits your brain in like 0 0.4 microseconds or something like that. If you see something that you perceive as a threat, a man will, you know, and... Society's made us believe many things are threats, but if you see something that's a threat or you, 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 you perceive that you're in danger, you get a release of adrenaline and cortisol and everything just like whoosh. It goes into a syringe and it goes straight into your brain and it takes like 0 0.004 microseconds to hit you. That is some hit. 
And we've became addicted to our own biochemical response to the reality that we live in, which is basically what you're saying, which is we've got a disease of perception. We've started to believe that this is real. All of this is real. None of it's real. Well, it's real and it's tangible in the sense that I can touch it, and that's real. But really... The dream that I had last night was very, very real, and I thought I was in it. How do I not know that this is just a dream? A dream that I'm creating by my mind, by my conditioning, by my past, by my reality. You know, it's, lots of people are saying that this could be a very high tech. Look at the virtual reality stuff that we've got. Look at the virtual reality that we're using in recovery. It's absolutely incredible. I got hooked on to one of these machines for um, uh, these virtual reality machines in London um, that they were using to deal with recovery. And it was absolutely remarkable how they were able to, through a heart rate variability and through the virtual reality, they were able to see how your response was coming up to the substances it was coming into the virtual reality. And then they were calming you so that you didn't have the charge on the substance and you fell into that virtual world and it didn't feel any less real than this world that we're living in right now. This world that we're living in right now is completely created by our perception of it. And sometimes we need the world to feed back, like a feedback mechanism. We need it to feed back what it feeds back in order for us to stay in the loop, in order for us to feel what we feel and see how we see. And we're at a time, we're in day eight, who knows how long this is going to go on for. And, um, you know, I'm speaking to people in America that are telling me they've went down another two conversations, actually maybe three, in the last 12 hours with Americans. and Two, I've had two conversations with two Americans. No, I've had three conversations with three Americans in the last 12 hours and they, they've went into lockdown for another 30 days. Um, they're telling me the amount of um, ammunition, guns, guns uh, have went up by, I think it was 14% just in the last week. What's that telling us? That's telling us that people are um, starting to get a wee bit territorial and maybe a wee bit paranoid. And, you know, it's difficult not I don't think I'm scared, um, but maybe I am. Maybe I'm collectively picking up on picking up on what's going on collectively. But you know, we are in a very terrifying time. It's it's very scary. It's we're actually a few steps away from civil unrest. If you start to think about it, things are starting to get things are starting to get real. Um, you know, and when I when I'm when when I'm working with clients or those that I'm sponsoring, the darkness that's coming into their thoughts right now, those that are honest enough to be able to talk about it, and I commend them for that, because there's people walking about out there right now that aren't honest enough to talk about what they're thinking, looting, pillaging, you know, that 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 predator that's coming up, and people that are in recovery are actually the most honest of the people that I've met, because the guy that's driving about is. Um, S-class Mercedes that passed me earlier on and he's wee shirt and tie on has he got any awareness that what he's thinking about I don't know but um, and that's dangerous and um, that then that comes a, a, a lot of fear and um, right now getting into a programme and getting yourself safe and getting yourself somebody to hold you accountable because it's very difficult to hold ourselves accountable would be my suggestion and um, as I said, I've went way over. I've went way over time. I'm uh, sucking into your time. So thank you very much for uh, listening and tuning in. Um, I really hope that it's been helpful. And to and if it's not, be really kind because I'm quite sensitive. No, say what you want. What worked well? What would have worked better? Let me know. I want to do my best for you. And um, I'm in service. I'm 100% in service to you and um, if you need anything let me know and tomorrow we're going to do step 5 and 5 and 6 so by Saturday night we should have completed all 12 of the steps and hopefully by then if anybody you will go and pick up the big book and you will go and read it and um, 
I wanted to actually read a wee bit out of the Coda book, which I'm going to finish with, so I'll just pick something. I'll just pick anything. Um, step four. Let me go to step four. Step four. Have I got something in my wee book here for step four? Step three. Well, we can do step three. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand God. So it's first make a decision. We have admitted we are powerless over the compulsive behaviours we have practised for so long. We are beginning to believe a higher power could relieve them. The next step was obvious. If we believed we were powerless and that a higher power could transform us, why not accept it? Why not give God a chance where he had failed? Besides, what did we have to do but lose our own misery? Our will and our fives, our old ideas called us to return to our self-will. Once again, we attempted to play God in our lives and the lives of others. Old doubts sometimes challenged our new thinking. We began to believe that even through this program worked for others, we were different. Losing hope, we questioned our ability to change. It was this experience that led us to acknowledge that this program of recovery was not a flash in the pan, something nice to do on a pleasant afternoon. It represented our opportunity to live as whole human beings. And if we wanted it, we would need the willingness to go to any lengths, even if it meant asking God for help more than once. So, God grant us the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. God bless. Look forward to speaking to you tomorrow night. Have a lovely evening. Thank you.